Okay. You see me? Okay. All right, so originally I'm from Israel, and I've originally put this lecture for my Israeli investors, meaning Israeli from, you know, Israelis from Israel, where I put a lot of items into it, mainly focusing on the differentiation or the gaps between the US real estate versus the Israeli real estate, which I know well as well. Um, then I said, you know what, actually it's pretty good uh, in my mind, it's really um, educational and a good uh, presentation, I should probably bring it to the group. By the way, for those of you who are here for the first time, I'm, although I'm the organizer of this group, I only speak once or twice a year in my own meetings. I mostly bring other speakers, so if you wonder how come this guy is bringing his own, speaking in his own group, that's because that's my uh, turn, uh, which I take once or twice a year to do. Uh, last time, I think it was in uh, January. Now, uh, then I thought, that's an interesting concept. I want to go to the basic. So there's a lot of people in this room been, and that have experience with, you know, with investing in real estate. I know you because some of you are working with me. Some of you I just know because we know each other. But I wanted to go to a little bit to the basic and talk about kind of the feature, the aspect, the process of just buying a property without going to so many strategies and tactics and so on and so forth. And that's why I've put this together. Uh, so that is a, this one is a very basic presentation on fundamental, I should say, about real estate investing or real estate purchasing. And let's, uh, let's get started. So disclaimer, as always, remember, practice safe uh, investing. Be, you know, make sure you do everything properly. You guys can see OK. Uh, if someone wants to improve their view, sitting position, come on uh, up here, no problem. Okay, before we move uh, forward, please pull up your smartphones and start tweeting, Facebooking, Google Plusing, whatever that you're here. Here's my hashtag, simply do it, or my name, Danny Benor. Uh, I'm gonna give you 10 minutes, go. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about the U.S. real estate market in general. I'm going to talk about how to gather intel, I mean intelligence about areas and properties. I'm going to talk about, you know, present some of decision-making tools when, you know, in the process of trying to determine what to buy, where to buy, etc. And uh, I'm going to talk about extensively, I should say, about the purchase process itself, and you know, break down step by step. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit investing here versus investing out there, meaning out of state. And then we're going to talk about mortgages, tips, suggestions, questions, LLCs, uh, you, know, all, you know, all of those things, all, all of those typical questions that we get all the time. Qu quickly again, I'm just going to, I'm going to mention, I've been investing since 2002 uh, when I used to live in Israel. I bought my first house in Phoenix, Arizona in 2002, closed in 2003. For those of you who have been long enough with investing, know that this was probably, you can guess, this was probably one of, uh, you know, a very good deal. It was. Uh, it was, uh, went up uh, dramatically. It crashed dramatically even more. Uh, so I've been through the highs. I've been through the low, like a typical drag addict, I, I guess. I don't know. I hope so. I have no experience with that, luckily. Uh, but I've seen it. I've been there. I've seen it both on my own personal skin and both with my investors, and I'm happy I was, you know, I'm still standing. Not only that, I was still able to, st you know, to stay standing and help my, and many of my investors when things crashed. I was there trying to help as much as I can, uh, even when things weren't going like this. Uh, so it wasn't, it was fun and no fun. Uh, and a lot of what I incorporate today into my presentations and my, my, the way I work with investors is really, uh, you know, I've, I've learned the hard way from the, you know, boom and the bust, and I share it today with my investors. I focus on single family homes, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, those are the states I've invested in over the years. Uh, some, you know, I did some land, some commercial, some tax liens. Uh, I used to have time to do tax liens, not anymore. And I've been involved with many hundreds of transactions of my investors, not just my, uh, myself. Now, this is a typical sentence, typical sentence, I'm hearing from my investors nowadays for the past year and a half, and maybe some of you or many of you can relate to it, saying, ah, this is actually me, okay? Now, I'm not gonna answer that. That question I'm gonna probably try and answer next week in the webinar, but if this is something that kinda, you know, resonates with yourself, then this presentation, and definitely the webinar next week, is something that you should kinda follow because that is a typical, uh, a typical thing I'm hearing from my investors 
these days. Okay. So far, everybody's good. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Timing. Let's talk. Let's talk about you know the you know uh, the our advantages. Let's start talking about timing. Maybe I should start by saying when I got started, not investing but working with investors. Every once in a while, I get a smart ass who wants to do the following deal. I'm talking about 2004, maybe 2005. I would get someone who said, you know what? I want to buy 20, 30 percent under market. I want to get it rented quickly. I want to cash flow with minimum, minimum uh, you know, down. And I can't remember, there's probably some other requests. And you know, I've, I would always say, that doesn't exist. You know, maybe you're lucky, you'll get one. But if you want to buy multiple properties, you know, we were buying at market value, maybe a little bit of a discount, nothing like we're seeing today. So when I got started, we would not get those amazing deals we can find today. Because we would buy at market value, it would, with 20% down, maybe, can, you know, break even-ish or so, Rental markets in many part, parts of the country were just okay to, you know, to reasonable. And today, everything that those once in a while people would ask me about, it's like every other deal, or actually I should say every deal almost. It's easy to cash flow. It's way below market value. It's, you know, uh, the interest rates are low. So all of this creates, you know, like almost the perfect situation to invest in real estate. And the opportunities that we're seeing in timing right now, the opportunities we're seeing are far better. For those of you who've been around, they know what I'm talking about, been around long enough, know what I'm talking about. Those who are just getting, uh, getting started or just recently gotten started, this is maybe new to you or you, you're maybe taking it for granted that those deals, it's what you can get one nowadays. But let me tell you, eight, seven, six years ago, it was not. Okay, it was okay, but not as good as today. So that is something you should not take for granted. Prices level, price levels are something in around the 2000-ish year. So that means 10, 12, even, you know, uh, years before. And that is something we see in many markets around the, the country, not everywhere. So that's just something to keep in mind. On the top of that, we have the combination of low interest rate, even got lower, which is just a gift to us, the borrowers. And then the low prices. Just keep that in mind if you're sitting on the sideline or if you're not sitting on the sideline but moving slowly, pick up the pace either way, I suggest, in my mind. Things are gonna be, um, uh, I think, we're already seeing recovery in, you know, in many markets around the country, okay? Uh, even here, I think there's some signs of recovery, uh, but other markets are already showing uh, tr tremendous signs of recovery. What I love about the, real, the US real estate market is the sophistication of the real estate, you know, uh, the real estate market, or the US real estate market. What do I mean by that? There are multiple ways we can acquire property. Used to be pre foreclosure, now it's REO, foreclosure, short sale, uh, seller financing, uh, open market, uh, bulk REOs, all of those. I, I know some of the terms, some of you know, some of you may not. You probably heard that, it doesn't matter. The point is, for me, the buyer, I have several ways how to buy a property. I love that. That's not how it works in many other countries. Many other countries, you have maybe one or two ways you typically buy properties. Okay? And then we have multiple ways how to sell properties. Right, seller financing again, uh, lease to own, you know, uh, uh, open market, uh, option, or some creative. Some there's a lot of ways. For us, what I'm talking about is you know wholesaling and all of those things. It's not something where we see it. You know, there are probably more deal being done as foreclosure types of foreclosure short sales. But every once in a while, we do those. We see those other deals like lease to own or seller financing as well. And that means to me. It creates me an environment that I always have a, you know, a, you know, a, an option. So that means if I can't sell it this way, I will, if I can't sell it with a broker, I will go to Mark and I will sell, will sell it with a system. And if Mark doesn't work for me, hopefully that will, I will find another way and there's another way. I, I just have to be a little bit more creative. But that is not something I have to think hard about how, how to do because there are multiple ways for me how to buy and how to sell properties. Okay, so that is an amazing, again, for granted for us, not for granted for someone who's coming from another country. Now remember, the U.S. real estate market is not the U.S. real estate market. It's 250 plus markets. Okay, Seattle does not behave like Silicon Valley. D.C. does not behave like New York, which doesn't behave like Dallas or Atlanta. So we always have, 
you know, locale, inf you, know, see, you know, scenario of locale, things that are affecting the, you know, the, uh, the market. For example, Dallas, it's like, you know, the, it's like, uh, um, it did not get, did not get effect from the, you know, the downturn. It can continue to go up, you know, in, you know, prices stayed steady pretty much. Jobs were, you know, continuing to grow. Population continued to grow. I'm not aware right now. I'm talking about in the past few years when we're seeing the downturn. Dallas was like, I'm not, in, I'm not playing in this game. By the way, Dallas did not play in that game when everything went up like crazy. Also, Dallas did not play in that field. Okay, so we're just sh showing us not every market is behaving exactly like the United States. So keep that in mind. Don't talk about the U.S. real estate market. Talk about the specific Silicon Valley. Even Silicon Valley and San Francisco and the East Bay, which are near each other, can have different behaviors locally. So just keep that in mind. Now let's talk about a few things that I really love about real estate. Some of you probably heard me talk about that uh, before, but I just want to repeat it, because this is something we have to remind ourselves every time. So let's talk about the mortgage, or what I call the mortgage miracle. What is the mortgage miracle? Mortgage miracle is, when we take a mortgage in the United States, the principal is not pegged to the cost of living. It's not indexed, okay? And let me explain that. So let's say in the United States, we get uh, a mortgage of $100,000 and the cost of living is here. We all know that cost of living goes up, right? Right? Yes. Okay, how do we know that? Give me, some, give me an example. Yes. Gas. Yes. How about rent, stamps, movie tickets, right? All those things are just indication that the cost of living goes up year after year on average, okay? <coughs> what happens to the, uh, to the mortgage principal in the United States? It does not keep up with the cost of living. It actually goes down. Why does it go down? Why? We're paying it, thank you. So we are paying the principal you know, year after year down. So that means a few years later, when we got started here, and cost of living went up, mortgage went down. How does it work in most countries? We start the same way, $100,000 mortgage, you know, mortgage, and cost of living is here. Cost of living goes up. What happens to the, you know, to the principal? Keeps up, okay? So for us, if we take it for granted, okay, then we forget that the fact that the mortgage are not keeping up with the cost of living are actually gift to us. So not only that it's almost free money, right, you know, 4%-ish or so, it's also, you know, a gift that we are getting, and we are eroding the principal year by the year by the fact that things are go, go, go up in price. So that is pretty, it's a very abstract notion, but it's an amazing. If you understand that, you are good, you know, and you follow that advice, that is enough. You don't, everything beyond that point is just, more, get, you know, getting better and better. Yeah, leverage, it's typical. Everybody knows we can buy, that much of an asset, okay, or that much of an asset with so much of our money, right? A hundred thousand dollar, you know, a property with twenty thousand dollars of our own cash or so, that's nothing new. Well, again, trivial, we take it for granted, but remember, it's far from it. Can someone here show me another vehicle, financial vehicle that lets you easily, rather easily, take so much, le so much leverage for so much of your own money? Right, stocks? No way. Options, no way. Some leverage maybe, but not as much. So real estate really allows you to use some of your, a little bit of your money to buy so much of, your, of an asset. That is another amazing thing. The way I look at you know, leverage is as follows. I borrow, fund, borrow money from a lender, I buy a rental property, and by the way, for the sake of this example, I will mostly talk about rental properties for this presentation. Okay, if you wanna talk about flips, we can do that. But to, to understand everything, I'm going to focus on rentals because that's just kind of uh, more simple to follow and to understand. Um, so I take, you know, I, I borrow some money from the bank, I buy a rental property, I rent it out, and what happens? A renter comes in, pays the rent, pays for the, you know, covers the expenses like property taxes and property management and whatever expenses, insurance, etc. And what else? Pays the mortgage. And then what? I'm left with some cash flow, right? So, you know, a few hundred dollars every month that there are cash flow in my pocket. So I'm borrowing it, but someone else is paying it back. Not only that he's paying it back, he covers all the costs and I get to keep some in my pocket. What? And pretty much from day one, well, maybe not from day one, day 
30, when we finally got it rented, right? So we wait 30 days patiently. We will get it rented. If anyone has a concern here about not renting properties, you know, talk to me later. It gets rented, okay? Been doing it long enough. I get those rent checks in the mail, puts a smile on my face. It gets rented. I've been doing it for 10 years. Yeah, I always get the, you know, I always get a smile on my face when I drive to the bank when it's not direct deposit. And even those properties that took a little bit longer to get rented, guess what? It got rented. You know, I don't do adventurous investing. I just do normal investing, I guess. Um, so you know, remember that. that. You know, the leverage is again. We know it's there, but leverage is not something you should take for granted. Okay? I dare you <laughs> go to the bank tomorrow and try to get a loan. Not for a property, just a loan. Because what? Because you want to. Okay? It's because you want to do something. Well, you, they want to send, they want to have some collateral, and they want to know who you are, and they may get you ten thousand or twenty thousand. Okay? Maybe some of you are very uh, uh, financially powerful, and you're going to do it like this very easily. But most people, if you go to the bank, the bank may give you a line of credit, obviously with you know with adjustable rate and eight percent or nine percent or so. Okay? And and, and limited one. And that'll be it, okay? When it comes to real estate, it's rather easy getting that leverage, assuming you qualify, okay? And you don't have to be perfect credit score to qualify. If you have a bad credit score, no job, no money, that'll be problematic. Sorry to say the truth, but that's the way it is. Okay, real estate quickly, uh, not quickly, just continuing. Um, real estate has some tax deductions. I'm not gonna go into the details of tax deduction. I'm just gonna say, Real estate can create an amazing situation where we have cash in our pocket at the end of the year, profits, and we are reporting a loss. What? Cash in the bank, reporting a loss. It's called because of depreciation, it's not always the case. Not only that, it's in, in some instances, we may even use that loss, remember it's on paper loss, against our own income in some situations. So real estate can even help us with creating that situation that we make money and reporting loss. Not only that, it may help reduce our taxes on our regular income. Now, one of my favorite features of real estate, at least in rentals, is what I call the side business effect. So many people are trying to establish a side business in their lives for whatever reason supplement income, you know, you know, need money, want money, whatever. Real estate is almost the perfect, perfect way to create a side business because when you buy a rental property and you just put it out there and it rents out with or without property manager, in state, out of state, I don't care, it doesn't matter. And you just put it out there and it rents out and it's not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be rented 100% of the time. Trust me, it won't. But how about 80, 90% of the time, at least on average, even more, it's gonna be rented. I have properties that are, you know, have been rented 95% of the time that I've owned them. And it just sits there. And the property manager takes care of it. And what happens? Does this business care if you're on vacation, employed, unemployed? What do you do for a living? Which country you live in? It doesn't, especially if you know how to do it. When it's generate cash flow and it's self-sustaining, that means you don't have to supplement any additional funds. And it sits there. And it's like a side business. I don't call it a rental property, I just call it a side business. Because it just sits there and it doesn't care what happened with me. I don't have to worry about my side business. Employee doesn't show up in the morning to open the, you know, the doors. The truck got broken on the way from the warehouse. Someone stole, someone got that, you know, done this, done that. I don't care, it doesn't, it's not depending that much on the human factor. Okay, actually there are two main components here. is the tenant and the property manager. There is a human factor, but it's a minimal one and it sits there in the background, and you know what? I can open multiple such side businesses by having another rental property and another rental property and another rental property, maybe not immediately, but slowly I will just build it and create my own little franchises of side businesses that are rental properties. And what? How much time do I need to put into one? Maybe an hour, half an hour a month per property, maybe not even that on average especially when I use a property manager. So that is something I really like about real estate because that can create, you know, that scenario, it's easy to create, it's easy to duplicate, and it's easy to do it from wherever I live. You know, this country, another country, I'm moving to another state, I don't have to relocate my business with me, it's just sitting 
you know, over there. So that's something I love about, you know, the side business effect. Now, one last point. The W2 versus the 1098. What do I mean by that? When you have a job, sometimes I get those people, more and more actually, they're coming and say, I love real estate, I hate my job, I want to quit my job, start doing real estate full time, which is good, I, you know, you should if you can, but remember this, two things will happen when you move from a steady job to a 1099 or 1098, whatever you want to call it, uh, income, two things will happen. One, when you talk about buying multiple properties over time, and you want to do it with mortgages, what does the lender want to see? Two things the lender wants from you. One, income. income, steady job, right? They want to see that you are, they don't care about the property, they care about the borrower. So they want to make sure you can qualify to pay back the loan. If you don't have the steady job, lenders don't like you. If you do, they love you, okay, that helps. Second thing, what does the steady job create for you, generates for you? Income, cash, something you save and use as a down payment towards your next investment. Because we don't get to see really 100% financing anymore. Not that even if we could have, we should have. But you should prepare yourself for some down payments, meaning some you know, uh, money out of pocket. So that job creates the stability, which the lender love, loves. And the, the money that you save from working, save from working, that you can put as a down payment. All right, moving on. Everybody is with me so far. You guys are awfully quiet today. You want to do some Zumba? <laughs> they just had a Zumba class here. Okay, let's just make sure we know when we buy a rental property. I know it's trivial. I just want to cover all the bases here. When we are landlords, we're going to be responsible for taxes. We're going to be responsible for insurance, property management, repair, vacancies. Uh, HOA, Homeowners Association, if that is the case. What is the tenant responsible for? You know, the rent of course, the rental deposit, and the, uh, the utilities. That's normally how that's split. I know it's trivial for most of you, I just wanna make sure we follow that. Okay, how do we choose an area? I'm just gonna start kinda, you know, zooming in. So that means we started on the very high level of real estate and then started to move to a market and then we'll go to properties, etc. So. What do we, how do we know, or at least what I like when I'm looking at metros to invest in? So basically it's the numbers, but the numbers is a very broad definition. Population one, population size. For example, I really like 1.5 mil population and above. That's great, some safety in the numbers that says economy of scale. Okay, that's me. Um, I have to, you know, I, I even can share with you today the smallest market I'm investing in is probably 2.2 or maybe a little bit over 2.2 million people, not even 1.5. By the way, one of those markets, oh, I'll get around to that. Um, I have, I like, well, there are multiple employers and multiple industries, okay? So that means if one employer or one industry is suffering, the area is not, you know, suffering as well, or maybe just a little bit. Which area does not qualify for that? Las Vegas, right? My problem in Las Vegas for years is that there's mainly one dominant industry and dominant you know, employers, I should say, or many employers, but one industry. And that for me is not favorable situation, even when it's a huge industry and a big one and they're putting a lot of investment, especially when I'm an investor and I don't care I don't, I don't fall in love with the market. I don't love Dallas. I don't love Atlanta. For me, it's alternative. Where can I do better or safer? Okay? Vegas doesn't qualify in my book for that reason. Okay? I know a lot of people love it. Many people love to say, you know, a dinner, you know, a dinner with friends. I have two tunnels in Vegas. You know, it's very sexy names. I know. I don't go for sexy names. I go for a uh, reality check. So can you say the same thing for the second body? Silicon Valley? Yeah, can you say the same thing? Like um, basically one big industry dominate the whole real estate market. In a way, yes. In a, yes, it's not, but, but you, you have more than one industry here. It's just there's one dominant one, but other big ones. So that means, you know, you could say, is solar energy, you know, Silicon Valley typical or not? Is the, the fact that you have um, uh, uh, Tesla here, is it? 
So there's a lot of relay, you know, other industries that are very heavy on, on high tech, but are not classical high tech like Abbott. You know, it's, it's a huge employer here, right? The, the uh, drugs. So there are other many, you know, multi, you know, big employers and industries here, but obviously there is a problem here, but I have a different problem with Silicon Valley and I'll get around to that, okay? Um, so we're gonna get, but think about, you know, let me ask you this, you buy a property here. The real estate, sorry, the, uh, the high tech crushes, you know, like half of the employers here are, you know, are, you know, are, are, are kind of letting people go. What will happen? Traffic is better. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Good or bad to your, for your, you know, your investments? Bad. Bad. So, realistically, yes. But it's kind of borderline, okay? Uh, so, yeah, if the reality check, it would not necessarily pass, but it could. So, it's, I would say borderline. Um, then I want to see what is the projected growth for employment and projected growth for population. Good projected you know, employment growth generates population. Very simple, easy math to do. And this information is not always, I'll, I'll show how to find that information. It's not always easy to find, but it's there. You just have to do a little bit of research or digging or let someone else do it for you. Uh, laws that are, you know, you know, laws that are you know, favoring the landlords is something that I like to have as a safety mechanism. Remember, safety is always there. Because some states, if you get to a situation that you have to evict someone, right? That's easy, fast, and cheap. Some states, guess which one, are not, okay? So this one, for example, is not that friendly. Some counties are better than others, but still it's not that easy um, like other states. I had an eviction in, in Dallas in 2004 or five, $241, two weeks the tenant was out, you know, by uh, a week later or maybe 10 days later, a new tenant was in. So that's how cheap and easy. I don't have a lot of eviction stories to tell you, but I do. I do personally, I mean, myself. For over the years, I probably have two and a half stories of, about eviction. Half meaning I didn't even have to go through the entire eviction process, just the note and they were out. And the tenants know that. So that's good too, right? The tenants already know the laws are not in my favor and they don't even bother fighting with you many times. Um, then obviously, purchase price, rent ratio has to make sense. Silicon Valley ain't working, okay? So that's one of the other problems with Silicon Valley that you get, you buy a 500,000 or a million dollar home and it rents for what, 4,000? That's, that's really not, not a very good ratio. Out there, you, you get a $100,000 home and it rents for about 1,000, that's a good ratio. You get a $60,000 home, rents for 900, that's a, a beautiful ratio. Um, and then I like to go to areas that are single family. You know, real estate is not a very liquid asset financially. Financial vehicle is not very liquid. But when it comes to real estate, liquid meaning it's not something you buy today necessarily and sell, you know, sell the next day, right? Without, you know, with making money. Yes, it's possible, it's rare, but it's not something you would plan for uh, or want to do in most cases. So real estate is something that we want to probably buy and hold for a certain period of time. You know, you know, create some value to it either over time or by you know, rehabbing it and sell it. So it's not a, you know, a day trading kind of a, you know, thing. But in the world of real estate, single family homes are probably the most liquid of the, you know, assets, all right? Um, condos even are not that liquid, you know, like real estate. Everybody wants to be in a single family home. Not everybody wants to be in a condo or town home. Not to mention how many people are, how many potential buyers do you have when you move from a single family home to a multifamily, even a small one, right? A smaller number of potential buyers, or when you move to a bigger commercial building or hotel or whatever, the bigger the property is, the more expensive it is, the less potential buyers you have. Single family homes are the most liquid ones. By the way, they're easy to calculate, rather easy to analyze, rather easy to understand, to kind of make a decision around that. So that's why I like single family homes. When it comes to uh, um, you know, get, gathering some information, so when we talk about the metro, I like to go to Wikipedia. You know, that gives me about, you know, information about the city or the metro or the county. I can look at either way. Um, so that gives me a little bit of an understanding who are the employers, sports team, capital, yes capital, not capital city, etc. cetera. Um, how many, what's the population, which metro it is in. Remember, metro is many times, could be as, as, as little as one, 
uh, county in as many as eight counties or more. I don't even know, maybe more. But that's not always easy. But sometimes some areas have, um, you know, they have a chamber of commerce for the county or chamber of commerce to the, for the city. And the chamber of commerce, they love putting information out there for us to find because they want to attract mostly employers. And they want to say, we are good for employers. This is why you want to come over. And we like that information because that tells us more about this, uh, this uh, marketplace. And those guys, they may be a chamber of commerce of the city, but it can also be a metro or, or a county. So you can, you know, it varies from one area to another. And then again, the county, not again, but the county information. So if you can't find the, you know, enough information on Wikipedia or Chamber of Commerce, look for the county uh, and then gather some more information when you're trying to determine which metro to go to. When you narrow down and you want to find a little bit more information, uh, zip skinny is something that you put the, you know, the zip code and that populates information about the, uh, you know, uh, about a certain area, demographic and so on. And then Zillow and Trulia also have, besides properties, if you look around in Zillow and Trulia and similar ones, they provide more information about the area as well, like price trends, trends and, you know, and uh, sales, etc. I'm sure everybody in the room have been to those sites. Just, if you have not looked around in Zillow and Trulia, just spend some time uh, to, uh, to look around and scroll down and see what else they have hidden in different tabs. That can be uh, helpful. We want to find properties, then obviously Zillow and Trulia and Craigslist and my website, uh, which is through my agents. You can do that too. Uh, it's almost as big. My website is almost as big as Zillow and Trulia. <laughs> uh, I'm getting there. Uh, maybe a million and point two five more properties and I'm here. I'm there. Uh, but it's a, it's a different method, obviously. Please remember, when it comes to Zillow and Trulia and similar ones, there's a lot of honey traps. And honey traps meaning an agent posts a property which gets posted either directly on Trulia or Zillow or through another website, and they put a lower price on purpose. Why? Because they want to capture you and want to kind of lead capture you in and create two situations. One. They're gonna tell you, you know, this property, you're, you wanna make an offer, it's, you know, it's posted for 78,000 and you wanna make an offer for 78, but I'm already gonna tell you this, I'm now you know, acting as the seller's agent. I already have multiple offers and that creates a hype of the property. So just be aware of that, okay? So you may or may not wanna look into that. Agents do it on purpose. The second thing, they say, okay, this property is no longer available, but at least now you have their name, your name, your email, and they can lure you in. Just be aware to that honey trap uh, uh, scenario. Not to mention Zillow and Trulia are not always up to date. And when it comes to short sale, by the way, is there anyone in the room who's not familiar or does not know what a short sale is? There is. Okay, I will explain just to make sure very briefly. A short sale means we're gonna, uh, uh, we're selling a property for less than what we owe on it. Let's take an example. Let's say we have a two, let's say we bought a two hundred thousand dollar property, and then we have a mortgage for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and the market value is let's say a hundred thousand, and we want to sell it for a hundred thousand, but we owe one fifty. So the bank has a contingency. The bank doesn't make a decision. The bank has a contingency approving the short sale, saying, "Okay, you can sell this property for one hundred thousand." and we will do something with the additional 50,000 or the, you know, the uh, unpaid uh, amount. We'll do something, we're not gonna go into what they're doing with it, but that means we're selling it for less than what we owe on it. Now, short sales are notorious for taking a long time to, to complete, but it's changing, and some people around the country know how to do short sale quick, so just be aware of that, that the short sale, long short sale is shrinking, and I've seen people doing short sale not as quickly as buying an REO, but not, you know, too far, you know, too, much longer than that. Um, I have an agent who's, uh, I think on average, does about 65 days for a short sale. That's pretty quick. So short sale, but going back to the Zero and Trulia, agent puts short sales on purpose for low price on Zero and Trulia, or gets to be on Zero and Trulia eventually, and and they say in a very unclear, you know, phrasing. It says short sale pending or waiting or approval, pending approval, all those little words that it's not very clear that actually the bank did not approve the short sale yet. Now, if you are doing a short sale, 
Make sure the person you are working with on a short sale has been, you know, has done multiple, many short sales in the past, and that's not his number one, two, or three, or four, because that means you have someone who knows how to handle that and can take you through the process and getting you to the end line, hopefully within a reasonable amount of time. Some short sales in the past that I've been involved in, we waited well over six months to get it done, and that was terrible, and the you know, investor got frustrated. Just be aware of that. Uh, so those are things you need to be aware when it comes to Zillow and Trulia, and similar ones. When we are analyzing properties, we're gonna look about you know, two main areas. One is the financial analysis, and one is the, uh, the quality data. So financial analysis, I like to use the following tools. FinanceExpert.com, free, easy, has a little bit of a, you know, a calculator uh, tool. It gives you, it populates, you put an address, it populates this, in most of the times, the specification of the property. Uh, it does the rent and the price comps, comparative market analysis, which is very nice. I found it to be very accurate. I use it all the time. It's probably the uh, number, somewhere in my top five websites that I use uh, to double check. When I get, uh, for my agent, a property with a rent, I verify that. There are people that I trust that I work with all the time, but I go there and I double check that. And I go to maybe Rentometer as well, Rentometer, just to double check the rent. So just uh, that's another uh, website we can go to to find the rent. Uh, finest Expert, just one thing to know about Finest Expert. It has a little bit of a score up, up at the top. And that's a very like, uh, you know, like a credit score. It's nice, but it's not fully functional. Meaning, when you change the price of the property in the little tool, the web tool that lets you change, plug in your own price for the property, not whatever they populated for, for it, the, this credit, the score doesn't change. So just be aware, if you're looking at the score, it's a nice you know, feature to have, but if you change the numbers, the score doesn't change. It's not dynamic scoring. So just be aware of that. Um, another website that I like, it's called realestateanalysisfree.com that's fully spelled realestateanalysisfree.com you sign up you plug in your uh, the, the property information and you can save it and then you come back again and you plug in another property and you save it in another one and the nicest thing about this tool is that when you have multiple properties that you've saved you can actually click and say compare them one next to each other to each other side by side like you would compare, uh, you know, like when you're buying a, some, some website, let's you say, when you buy, a, um, you know, a, like a, a camera online, and you can compare between different cameras online, that's a similar way. It, so it lets you compare, that's why I like this tool, so it let, gives you side-by-side -side comparison between different properties that you're evaluating. And uh, the one tool that I think is probably second best to the next one I'm going to show is Property Evaluator. It's what I use on my website on connectrei.com. Uh, it's a property evaluator. It's really the only tool that I have found to have an extensive analysis that takes into consideration so many factors. A lot of those tools here do not do it so extensively and then put it rather easy out there. So you can use property evaluator. It's not a free, if you go to my website, my properties, you will be able to see, to use it. But if you want to use it, um, for yourself, there's a, you know, it costs about 20 bucks a month, and you can have your own property evaluator, and then what's called property tracker. It also helps you manage properties, so that's nice. Uh, and then I'm gonna show another tool in a second. Uh, when it comes to quality information, I use agents, local agents. <coughs> I use people that I've built relationship and trust with to provide me data. Those tools here, they don't know the condition of the property. They know nothing about the area. So that doesn't help me. It's just very black and white situation. Good property, the numbers are good or bad. Over here, I get the, the agent to go to the property, tell me there's a problem, there isn't a problem. It's a good area, bad area. It's an okay area. Go for it, you should go consider it or not. So that's something I'm, you know, I trust the agent. I also talk to the property managers. They have a, many times a different perspective on things and may provide me with a different answer regarding the, the agent on, a, on an area or on a property. So that's the other, uh, other, other uh, uh, 
um, input I get from a, for quality data. And then an expert, expert would be someone like myself, similar people that to me, that, that's what we do for a living, and we can help put all of that together and kind of make a decision if this is a good investment, bad investment, uh, or, or okay investment, especially when I get to know people, it helps me to, to make a suggestion, is it the, the good, the, the right investment for you? Now, I use my Excel. This is Excel, I've been, you know, a template I've downloaded a while back, and then since then I've, you know, continue improving, if, improving it. Um, if you want to use it, then just send me an email, I'll send it to you, no problem. Um, what I look for, I'm not going to go into the Excel because it's tiny and we, you know, it's not, uh, you know, we don't have the time for that, but I look at three factors for my return on investment. I look on cash on cash, meaning what's my cash flow at the end of the year versus how much I actually invested. Not how much it cost me, not how much the down payment was, how much I invested. For example, it, you know, the down payment may, you know, the down payment may have been 20000 but then I needed either some closing costs, and some mortgage costs, and maybe some repair fees, and so on. So, if for me twenty thousand, I ended up going, you know, being out of pocket thirty. For me, that's the real number, not the down payment, and that's what I use for my cash and cash return. On the top of that, I factor two, you know, I factor in two more components. One is properties do tend to appreciate over time. I may call it one percent, two percent, ten percent, whatever you want to call it. You make a decision, but they do. So I factor that as well. And I also factor the fact that when I buy with a mortgage, year after year, the principal is shrinking and the equity is you know, increasing. And I factor that as well into the equation. Now, in order to truly do it, and that's why I like the property evaluator that I talked about you know, here, because that exactly you know, mimics my, uh, my Excel, is that I spread it. That's why it's so long, it actually goes all the way over here, <laughs> over here, 30 years, and then I do averages. I take the first five years average, first 10 years average, 20, and, you know, 15 and 20, I don't go beyond that, and that tells me what the actual return on investment is, okay? So I don't just do it the first day, a lot of the, you know, the, a lot of the websites and a lot of the, uh, the uh, specification sheets you get to see in events, they give you the first day how it looks like. That's for me, it's a very superficial, superficial way to you know, analyze a property, a rental property. For me, spreading it and then kind of seeing, because things change over time, right? So, you know, the, this one factors that there is a, this one factors that there is a increasing, you know, in cost and increase in rent and so on and other factors involved. That's why I do it, I spread it over and And again, you want to use it, no problem. Here's my email, or you have my email, you'll see it later. Send me an email, I'll send it to you with pleasure, or just a link to my website that you can download it. Okay, so far, any questions? <coughs> Thank you, yes, I need a break. Just kidding. Uh, <coughs> what number is good uh, for purchase price? The purchase price rent ratio? Yeah. I would say the 1%, like $100,000 property rents for 1000 a month. That's a good ratio, okay? I get, I get to see better than that, but that just gives me a ballpark feeling, okay? So right there when someone tells me a million dollar rents for 4000 in Silicon Valley, that's for me already my, uh, you know, my, my flag, my red flag starts you know, swinging like crazy. Okay, so that's just a, a, a you know a ballpark. So you are telling us twelve percent is the minimum, right? I'm not saying that's the minimum. I'm saying a reasonable ballpark. When I analyze real estate or properties, I don't factor on one parameter. There's multiple factors that are getting involved, such as location, price, what is the down payment, how much work it would need after, what is the rent going to be, how's the rental market, how's the, what's the condition of the property. So I can't just narrow down on one factor, like only the rental market, or only the vacancy, or only the rent, it's a combination. So I, but when you analyze, when you look at many properties, you want to start getting a feeling of what would be the right property or right figures. If something is not, let's say, let's say you have a, you know, a, um, a range, and if, if you can see that the rent, the rent purchase price ratio is not within that range, 
Okay, if it's below that range, you probably what you decide what your range is, but you say, okay, that's already problematic. If it's beyond that range, it's probably good. Okay, and, you know, I have areas that are more than that. So I'm just kind of, you know, giving you a feeling, like, especially when we, when we kind of try to first, you know, to initially analyze. Yes? So it's, you know, with all these tools, it's relatively easy today to kind of get an estimate of what rent would be, you know, your rent a meter up, for example. How do you estimate what the vacancy factor is? Because vacancy, you know, varies from neighborhood so, to neighborhood. Right. So what is the vacancy factor? Not in, it, used to, it used to be sites that would give you the vacancy factor for the area. They kind of disappeared, I don't know. I, I don't have a website to tell you. I talk to the property manager and the agent. I get their feeling, but, there is a but here. Um, based on my experience, my properties are probably on average, on average by portfolio, I would say tenant changes every two and a half years. So that means if I'm gonna be very, kind of uh, worst case scenario, then I'm gonna do every six months or every year. I do two years. So that means if the vacancy factor is 8%, I consider annually 4%. That's what I do. I have an investor who says, I'm like you, but I do 18 months and not 24 months. So all those expenses, like leasing fee, when, you know, when you place, when you put a new tenant in the property, instead of doing an annual leasing fee, I do it every, uh, for t every two years. So that means I divide it over 24 months in order to reflect it in my Excel. That's what I take. But I talk to my, by the way, it's worse than what the reality is, right? I, I said already two and a half years, but I wanna be a little bit conservative. I, the way I analyze properties in general, my personal philosophy, you have your own. You know, I've been an entrepreneur since I was 16. And every time I had a business idea, I would go either to my dad or my, my brother-in-law when I was younger, and they would always show me the worst case scenario, and guess what? Every idea or every deal or everything, you know, you know, didn't go, you know, many of them did not go, you know, to fruition because you killed the deal. I, you know, then I don't want to do the, you know, the, you know, the most, the best case scenario. So a few years ago I decided, here's my scenario, realistic life scenario. Whatever realistically it should be, that's the way I follow. I maybe do it a little bit more conservative. Some of my investors already told me, you're a little bit too conservative for us. Okay, you do better than what I'm telling you, fine. They don't do much better in what I'm telling them. They're doing a little bit better, but that's the way I choose to be. Just a little bit conservatism, not to kill the deal, because otherwise nothing will pass that Excel. Nothing, okay? That's the way I, that's the way I look at it. You have to, you know, to follow your own lead. It's a personality thing. It's, a, it's an experience thing. It's comfort zone and so on. Okay, let's talk about the purchase process.